ticking. It's a pipe bomb. Yay! Yay! Hey, you. You're finally awake. Welcome back to Wish for Death Island, population me and you. And we have this new wizard school opening up called Global's Spunder Crab, where you can learn all the spells to mildly inconvenience someone and make them lose their pens. So this review is going to cover the book and the movie for the first entry in the Harry Potter series, and because this is a general introduction as well, I'm going to cover some other general things about Harry Potter, but the more that we get into the series, the more specific I'll be with my general commentary. Also, I just want to mention, because when you criticize something, there's always someone who's like, but you said that you liked it. Why do you have questions about it? I am a Harry Potter fan. I've been one since I was a kid and I've read the books several times. I've played all of the PlayStation games several times. I've watched the movie several times. I tried watching Fantastic Beasts and I didn't like it. I am never going to acknowledge the cursed child, so I don't. But as always, even with stuff I like, I have a lot of questions about it and JK Rowling is not a good writer. <laughs> and as someone who has gone through many a writing class and got a useless English degree, I think I have a lot to say about it, especially concerning the idea of soft magic and rules surrounding world building and as someone who is very intent on writing and publishing some work one day, I have a lot to say about that from that perspective as well. Buckle up for this one because I feel like each video is going to be longer than the last. And uh, concerning the fandom, I'm largely going to ignore the fandom because I feel like you just kind of have to get over the fact that fandoms kind of suck and continue looking at the work on your own because I could go on about how the fandom is bad because it's filled with this, 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 this person. Person. And then there's this guy who's just on his own in a completely different category and I don't know what's happening. Honestly, that's just something that you have to see in everyone. Also, quick thing before we start, you see me doing art in the background. I kind of needed to work up enough courage to share my art again and eventually I want to work up to doing commissions, but I haven't done them so far because I don't think I'm good enough to do them yet and I can't really justify myself asking for money for them. But hopefully soon because I'm getting more confident and as always like criticism is welcome. If you want to know what I'm working with I'm using Clip Studio Paints and the only thing that I use is the default round brush at different sizes and capacities. Everything I'm doing I'm just using that. So we start the book with an introduction on the Dursleys and their stupid idiot son. The book says nearly twice the usual amount of neck. That is a fucking roast. <laughs> They go on to say that they have not that great relationships with the Potters, who are related through Petunia being sisters with Lily Potter. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son too, but they had never seen him. The boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. The first thing is that it sets them up as being kind of shitty people, but the thing is, there's also this kind of idea that later on we get introduced to the idea of the Horcruxes, and those are these things keep Voldemort alive by putting himself in a bit of each of them and Harry kind of became one of those when Voldemort tried to kill him and it rebounded. Another thing is that the Horcruxes make everyone around them kind of temper tantrum me and one of the things that people think that that implies is that the reason that the Dursleys are so fucked up to Harry is because he was kind of making them that way by being a Horcrux and that was a side effect. And I kind of think if that's what Horcruxes do, if they kind of fuck up the people that are spending a lot of time around them, then if that's not something that's happening with Harry, then why isn't it happening? JK Rowling sets up these specific rules and then I feel like around Harry they kind of collapse. I, they're kind of set up to be shitty people but then they get kind of shittier, and that shittiness may be implied to be caused by the fact that Harry has some weird Voldemort fuckery going on with him. Later on, they have this like tiny mini redemption arc just before he leaves them for good in the seventh book. They're trying to apologize, but they don't really. And I just wonder, one of the big things that I have with this book in terms of criticisms is just a lot of the characters, when you look a little deeper, end up being a bit underdeveloped. So I'm getting ahead of myself when I just said that I was trying not to do that. So we'll move on to the next one. So they go through their day and Mr. Dursley goes off to work. He pecked Mrs. Dursley on the cheek and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye but missed because Dudley was having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Every now and again a sentence irks me in this. Like this could have benefited from truncated sentences or something. It seems a bit like a draft sentence to me. This is also where we start getting into some of the unusual events as our introduction to the wizarding world begins, such as the cat on the wall. 
It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar, a cat reading a map. So this is McGonagall watching over the house, but wouldn't McGonagall be more careful to not show herself reading a fucking map as an animal in daylight? I know what you're going for, but in hindsight of who she is, don't you think that the first thing that she would be doing would be trying to be more inconspicuous? It seems so whimsical, because a lot of the first book seems whimsical, but a lot of that clashes with some of the later entries in the series where they get really serious, and part of it is yes, the landscape of the world is changing because there's more threats and Voldemort's coming back, but another part of it is just, I feel like retroactively with all of the retcons that she does, she really wanted to change the way that some of the things in the wizarding world work, I did to, you know, shove them in. You'd think that there'd be more conspiracy theories going around with the muggles, or with the fact that these wizards seem to just do their magic everywhere, so at least someone's gonna notice, but we don't really get that much of a focus from the muggle perspective, so I have to wonder how effective are wizards really with keeping themselves a secret? It seems like everything they do is a bit obvious to the muggles, but the muggles just happen not to notice because they're all NPCs or something. Mr. Dursley happens upon a group of people in weird clothing too, standing in groups and whispering in plain sight without putting on their muggle clothes properly. People in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people. It's weird how all of this happens and then they go out in public and just talk about whatever and later on they're super secretive. It's like Rowling realized her fuck up in the first book and then just like fixed it. There are some more things that Dursley doesn't notice but are explained to the audience such as owls flying above. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though the people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead. In the later books we discover that they have port keys and things like that where you can teleport more effectively and there was those fireplace ways of communication. I remember in the fifth one Sirius's head was in the fireplace. Aren't there other ways of- uh, less conspicuous ways of sending information? Like, can't you teleport a letter in some other way like this, or send one of those fireplace messages? It just seems like there's a series of ways of communication established, and then later on there's more, more things added, but I wonder why they weren't used as widely before, because it seems like they're easier to use than owls for everything, especially with a lot of the teleportation ways. I also- one of the writing focus criticisms that I also have is that things that he noticed could have been much more subtle, because later on we basically get the same information repeated to us from the news, and from the ominous conversations that they have in their house, and I feel like that could have had more impact if these weren't just straight they stated. For example, these could have been dark shapes flying overhead that you assume would have been normal birds, but then on the news later they were owls. And this is sort of my personal viewpoint, so it's not really that much of a big deal, it's just I like more subtle writing when it comes to this sort of thing, and JK Rowling definitely have these moments where she just directly tells what's going on. So there's more whispering from the funny people and the potters are brought up and their son. This snippet also works better if it would be surrounded by more subtle things. Like, why not have this with Mr. Dursley walking by, not hearing those things, not hearing the owls, and then hearing the name suddenly and getting a shock? I'm trying not to repeat myself and I'm starting to sound like one of my creative writing professors and I don't know how I feel about that, but you get my point. One of the weirdly dressed people approaches Mr. Dursley and says the following, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the middle and walked off. I don't know, say, same shit about subtlety, just an insert comment here. Some of these sentences, or some of the dialogue rather, the exposition comes across as a bit too in your face. I can't really explain what I'm trying to say well, but it just, it, it irks me a bit because it just seems a bit stilted. I also have to wonder, would these wizards so blatantly out and about, the the Ministry is later on seen as hard on these wizards, like the Ministry of Magic is going to crack down on this, but they don't seem to really care in this case. I have other general world building questions about how this infers that the Ministry is quite incompetent at what they do from an early on type of stage, but 
the ministry is also very underdeveloped especially with when they get occupied by the death eaters in the seventh book and this doesn't really reflect too much i just wonder how they operate in terms of what how they deal more broadly with wizards who are doing magic in public because i know that they do a certain thing when a student goes out and does magic outside of hogwarts but with stuff like this what do they really do they don't really do anything do they i mean i guess if we really wanted to get into it there's that one really stupid part at the end of fantastic beasts where they rain down this amnesia spell on everyone but only do it so that if you're standing undercover or watching from one of the buildings you won't get hit by it so it looks really stupid mr dursley returns home and on the way sees the cat sitting in the same spot and notices that it has markings around its eyes and seriously it could have been so much cooler without so much of the cat already been given away in the previous scenes. Once he's home, he watches the news while Petunia is doing Petunia things in the background. The newscaster says, And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. This is what I was talking about previously. It doesn't really seem that interesting to hear about after we already know the owls are out and about. I guess now we know it's more global, but it, it's just like, okay, sure. And uh, the thing he says about fireworks next, they've been phoning to tell me that instead of the rain I promised yesterday, they've had a downpour of shooting stars. It seems a little overkill. We also, we haven't seen anything about shooting stars before, so that's kind of interesting. The owl thing, not so much. Like, I would think that the ministry would be doing serious damage control for how loud these wizards are being, Voldemort dying or not. So Mrs. Dursley asks what's up and Mr. Dursley says, funny stuff on the news, owls, shooting stars, and there's a lot of funny looking people around town today. So, snaps Mrs. Dursley. It also shows this kind of like ominous conversation where she doesn't want to acknowledge any of that stuff, so even bringing it up is something that he does on thin ice. And they kind of cut it off there a bit, which is something that I do like because it's a lot more like they actually do really hate to acknowledge whatever the fuck is going on with the Potters and they don't like it at all. And she feels a lot more threatened by bringing this up because of the fact that she's related to them directly. And uh, this, the, what I'm trying to say is that the seeds for a very exciting mystery are buried beneath some of these other things. One of them is coming up. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well what he and Petunia thought of them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect how very wrong. I do not like the last part of that paragraph at all. This could work way better without the last paragraph. There's this thing that she does where she says something like, he should have known that it wasn't going to last, or he was very wrong because of what happened. It's like a clickbait title put in the middle of it. I really don't like when writers do this unless there's a very specific reason for it with their writing style. This is not one of those times where it's appropriate. It ruins every sense of tension that would happen in the next part. Like, imagine if this part was cut out and then the next one began with either a truncated sentence or something that was starting very early on in a normal fashion and then suddenly went into the thing that went wrong. It's, I, I don't need to know this. I don't need to know it went very wrong because we're at the beginning of the fucking book. Of course, it's probably going to go wrong. And even if it doesn't, it's probably going to go wrong for somebody else because that's what happens. She does this very inconsistently as well. Like one of the appropriate reasons would maybe have been a motif. Like if you don't know something that kind of turns up in the book as a pattern. It's like a rhythm of writing. It's like something that links back. Sometimes a motif might be an image or a phrase. It's just like a pattern that you can recognize and every single time the motif might mean something a bit different or add onto it or even like parallel the events with circular storytelling. Jesus Christ, I do sound like my fucking creative writing professor. Oh my god. One of the, the other things that she does later on is she'll set up these kind of mini motifs like saying the first rule of the Dursleys is never ask questions and do stuff like that or it starts to go somewhere but then she just drops it off. She was just looking for something to put into that paragraph and didn't really think about taking it out and putting it in something that fit more. Again, this is more me going on about writing styles and technical stuff than actually talking about the 
plot itself, but uh, I'm, I'm nitpicky. Another thing that I put in my notes, especially about the paragraph that we just read, is there's this type of foreshadowing that Rowling does where she hams it up way too much to the point where it ruins the payoff. She does this only a few times, so it's not even something that's very consistent within her tone. I think that simple editing would have removed this, and if she developed her style a little bit more, which is something we all try to do, if she just tried to do that a bit more, which if you read some of her non-Harry Potter work, she definitely does not. I know that p people don't want to bring up that non-Harry Potter writing that she does without bringing up politics. I don't really give a shit. Regardless, it's not good. Anyway, continuing, we leave the Dursleys to sleep, and we have a view of the street out at night. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching, appearing so suddenly and silently, you'd have thought that he just popped out of the ground. Why is Dumbledore just appearing everywhere? There's, again, one of the nitpicky things is I feel like some of Dumbledore himself is very inconsistent. For one, he does have that sort of mystery and I do think that it is good in a way where he starts off kind of whimsical, like Dumbledore knows everything and he's everywhere. Isn't he a happy, jolly man? And then it kind of gets deconstructed later on in the series with some of the darker secrets that he has and the fact that he's not a perfect man, he's done a lot of bad things. But in the same vein, this is not something that I feel was planned. I feel like she had a general idea of his character, but you can tell when he first turns up in the book, it's like, look at the funny man. And then later on, it just kind of slams you in the head that <laughs> he was kind of fucked up. So I feel like she just added that in later. Reading the whole series over again also has that kind of foresight advantage where you can tell what she kind of didn't plan and what she did. And it makes the first book quite inconsistent. And again, I have something to say about the fact that this man is just appearing out of nowhere with funny clothing in the middle of the street where people are probably considering the neighbors and the fact that Petunia herself was spying out the window for no reason. Someone's probably gonna see that, right? Dumbledore's just there and talking about Harry things with McGonagall who just transforms because middle of the fucking street. Exposition time. Dumble Bumble then brings up how everyone is celebrating and Harry is gonna be mega mega famous, dee dee mega doo doo famous because of the big bad Voldemort dying at the fucking baby's hands because Voldemort's pathetic. Harry's parents are also dead though. McGonagall is not happy about this because she understands that people are too obvious about their celebrating and the muggles are gonna find out and the ministry doesn't seem to give a shit. Oh yes, everyone is celebrating all right, she said impatiently. Do you think that they'd be a bit more careful, but no. Even the muggles have noticed something's going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back to the Dursley's dark living room window. She's acting like this isn't normal. Like the, the, the amount of suspicious activity that the wizards go through every day for the muggles to notice is pretty much on on the spot for what's happening right now. Don't act like this is different. All of you are dumb shit. Dumbledore says, Voldemort had powers I will never have. And then she says, only because you're too, well, noble to use them. And this dialogue really fucking irks me. It's way too ham-fisted. Come on, drafting, JK Rowling, drafting. Dumbledore is being foreshadowed to have great powers that are never explained. And in some ways, I actually like that they're never explained because he goes into a bit of his family, but they never really go into entirely who or what he is. He's kind of like an entity in a way, and I do like this. However, later on in the certain other movies that were added on that I don't consider canon. He's revealed to just be part of a magic family, like all of the Dumbledores just happen to have these powers because of reasons, and it removes any sense of mystery that he has. So as much as I rag on this series for not explaining any of its magic rules or any of its soft magic, I do appreciate the fact that Dumbledore himself remained a lot of a mystery in this series. Dumbledore goes on to bring up that Harry is going to be staying with these idiots, and McGonagall brings up that the fact that they're terrible people and most likely abusive, and she doesn't like this. Dumbledore, with all of the stuff that he does know, and the fact that one of the things that should have been explained a bit more is like the consistency of what he does and does not know, it implies that he has this level of omniscience. I can only guess or assume that he knows that the Dursleys are fucking idiots and probably abusive, but he decides that this is just better for Harry right now. Is there really no other way that Harry could have been a bit safer? Like, even with like a random couple that they just look at for a couple days to see if they're good people, and then like talking to them again later. Also, there's this implication that Dumbledore seems to know that Voldemort isn't actually dead like everyone thinks. He's gonna come back at some point, and one of these precautions is that he's gonna put Harry in with this family. But I feel like Voldemort would 
probably have a way to find out who the Potters were connected to and then go to those people to see if they have Harry. In fact, in the seventh book, Harry leaves the Dursleys because he knows that they're going to be in danger that he's with them. So why can't they just find some other random family instead of placing them within the household? It feels like they're just putting the Dursleys in unnecessary danger as well, which is also kind of strange because you'd think that they would at least try to send someone to Harry's family to try and see if Harry's there to get him outside of a school term, but they never seem to do that because I guess even villains care about childhood education, despite the fact that the entire school is a death trap, but once again, we're gonna get into that later. Because if Dumbledore knows that the house is abusive as well, or the fact that they don't want to go along with the magic thing because they don't want to acknowledge that the Potters exist, he should also know that Harry is not going to get the information that he needs. Petunia is going to read that letter that he sends Harry off with, but she's not going to share that information with him, and if she does, then she's- I don't know, she's probably going to get something wrong. Why the fuck would she be obliged to tell Harry anything? Observations of her character have shown that she will not do this. And I do assume that Dumbledore does know something fucky's going on, considering that he sends Hagrid to get the Philosopher's Stone from Gringotts when he takes Harry to Diagon Alley later on, so I don't really get what his big plan is here. Anyway, Dumbledore's Dumbledore. I'm not gonna question Dumbledore because he's Dumbledore. Dumbledore! But Dumbledore counters McGonagall's arguments with, It's the best place for him, Dumbledore said firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything with him when he's older. I've written them a letter. Why would he assume this? Especially McGonagall still disagrees because she's the only one with any sense in this world. Oh, and then can we talk about how Harry was brought here by a fucking giant bike with Hagrid on it? How loud was that? Do you think some people were gonna notice or not? Good luck, Harry, he muttered. He turned on his heel and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. So everyone just leaves afterwards and Harry's on the doorstep. Like seriously, there has to be someone else that he could live with. If it's too dangerous to live with anyone from the Order of the Phoenix because Voldemort's going to go and get them, then wouldn't their relatives also not be safe? Also, this is just speculation on my part, but I've always loved to see the idea of Harry growing up with someone else. Like, what if he, Sirius, was somehow not framed for murder and he could grow up with him? I just like the idea from purely like a fan standpoint of seeing some sort of other reality. So then we get to the next chapter, which is Harry growing up with the Dursleys and what had happened from that point. Nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report on the owl. This is a terrible paragraph. I feel like this entire paragraph could have been much more concise. We get this idea that everything is frozen in time, and instead of either just wrapping that up concisely and moving on with a simple sentence, or even going a bit further with a more subtle description, it's just like, it's the same. Did you know? that things are the same because they're the same. It's another issue I have with something that could easily be redrafted. If you're not going to actually say what you mean in a way that's either creative for the purpose, strict purpose of the plot and your writing style, and that makes sense, at least wrap it up in a way that's easy for the audience to just acknowledge and move on to the important stuff. I am my creative writing professor. I hate it. So we get some exposition on who Harry is, which is largely fine. This is okay, I guess. He is small and skinny and he's fast and he lives under the stairs because they neglect him and don't like him in general, and he doesn't know why besides the odd comments that they make about how they don't like his parents, who apparently died in a car crash, and Harry can only remember flashes of green when he tries to think about what happened. Dudley is also continuing to be a little shit, except he's a fatter shit now. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Show don't tell, Rowling. Show don't tell. And as for your Twitter opinions, I'd rather it be just don't tell. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for quiet life at the Dursley. So this, again with the motif thing, she starts one of these motifs as if she is going to continue going on about the rules of the Dursleys and structure this in a sort of stylistic way, but this is the first glimpse that we get of such a thing and she abandons it, so it just feels kind of out of place in the sentence. Remember, you either have a motif or you rephrase it so that it doesn't look like an inconsistent start of a motif that just leaves off. I know that that sounds really strange, but when you're reading something that somebody wrote, even if you don't entirely know what is wrong, because you know you're not like really paying attention to that particular thing, you will notice that something is wrong. You just can't put your finger on it. So the best thing that you can do is to find a way for you to identify that those things are wrong in other writing so you can fix it. I've also had problems where I start doing these 
stylistic things and then I just drop them off and I don't notice that I've done it. So when I reread it, because drafting is a thing, I find out because I look at other people's work and find out that they do that too, or like something like Jeff Lindsay or Chuck Palahniuk's work, where they do heavily use motifs because that's what they intentionally do. And once reading those, I feel like it's easier to pick it apart in my own work. And when I see something like this, it's just, it's a red flag. So disregarding the lack of rhythm in the writing and returning to the actual plot, Dudley is a big bitch and Harry needs to make breakfast for these lazy hoes because he is a poor child. Petunia apparently senses when her failure of a child is going to get violent and tries to damage control as much as possible. Dudley does not have enough presents this year, so she promises him more presents will come soon because enabling is a healthy behavior. Aunt Petunia obviously sent a danger too. For some reason, I really don't like the use of the word obviously most of the time that it appears in writing, unless it's dialogue or some very intentional type of writing style. The word obviously is really redundant and pads your word count with something that really shouldn't be there. They go on to explain that Dudley is going to the zoo today with his dumbass friends, and they don't want to take Harry, but the old lady that they usually leave him with broke her leg, so they have to do something else. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. Firstly, fuck you, slugs are cool. Secondly, it is not necessary to talk about this when you show it literally in the same scene and in the next scene. They say Dudley should bring Harry along for the zoo because they assume that Harry is going to damage the house when he's home alone. I guess he's gonna call an airstrike on them. He's gonna tell the US that they have oil. Then Dudley starts crying immediately. But he knew that if he screwed his face up and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. The same criticism that I have about explanations here, we just saw that he starts crying immediately when he doesn't get something he likes. It's a suspicious enough. It's suspicious enough in the next scene when he immediately shuts up too. You don't need to tell me that he has crocodile tears, I can see that, I'm not that stupid. Even when I was a kid reading this, I could see that that was what he did because as a kid, I knew little shit kids who did that too. Kids are not as stupid as you think they are, they, they can understand this shit. They promise to continue to buy his affection with material gifts as well, so he decides that he's going to shut up crying and that he's okay with Harry being on the trip as well. Also, the fact that his friends show up and he doesn't want to cry in front of his friends. Dudley stops pretending to cry at once. One thing I'd say about Rowling in general is that she doesn't really have much of a writing style as well. For those of you who are watching from a writing perspective and you also don't know how to find a writing style or you're putting pressure on yourself to find one, as someone who has been in the same boat and is currently trying to develop a style while I work on my novel draft, I'd like to introduce you to this really fantastic ideas that Chuck Palahniuk has even if you don't like him as a writer, I really really like the stuff that he provides in terms of tools that you can use as well. If you find yourself in a stagnant place, one of these is removing all of the words like feel, think, or thought, or anything like that that tells what the character is feeling, and trying to replace it with actions that show. I'll link something to it because it's a bit too much to explain, but it's really hard, but it really really helps. It's this idea that you can tell what someone physically is feeling, like you don't need to go on and on about how someone's tired, you can just say that they're tired in maybe a bit of a better phrased way, but when you have an emotion, you can tell it through actions or memories that are more subtly woven into the story, and it does develop. Whether or not you continue to use it after you've done the exercise is up to you, but it does develop a better style, I feel, if you're feeling a bit lost. Again, that was a tangent, that was just like a tool, but... The next thing that happens is that Harry goes on to think about how weird magical things would happen to him in his life that he couldn't explain. For instance, they hacked off his hair until he was almost bald because they wanted to give him a haircut before the new school term. He just grew it back overnight somehow and they don't even bother with his hair anymore. He would somehow shrink clothing that he was being forced to wear so that he couldn't wear it anymore and they would just give up on it. He somehow ended up on the roof of the school when the bullies were chasing him and he didn't know why. He also explains his dream about a flying motorbike when they're getting in the car to go to the zoo, and Mr. Dudley starts reeing because he doesn't like Harry bringing up fancy things of any nature. This also makes me bring up several questions about how the magic system works regarding young people. You see, when you have something like sci-fi, you need to have some strict ideas of what you can do because it is sci-fi. It's by nature pretty mechanical, and if it gets to the point where it's basically magic, it's usually so advanced anyway that you have a bunch of other problems to deal with. 
But when you have something like magic, you do have a level of mystery that gives you an excuse not to explain everything. One of the reasons that I keep saying the term soft magic is because it's like the magic that has less rules to it and is more just like kid show magic is just soft magic, it doesn't really matter. But when you get something that's a very serious fantasy thing that takes itself extremely seriously, you need more rules to it and you'd see that there's big consequences and like very established uses of like mana and or mana however you say it and other things like that i think that the problem is when you have something that's kind of in between like harry potter it starts off being like this magical whimsical kid school thing so if just book one and maybe book two existed i'd be fine with just letting it go but the fact that it evolves into such a serious series further on that is apparently have has consequences i would assume that there would be some sort of consistency with the way the magic system works but especially in book one there really isn't like with some of these scenarios, I can't help but wonder, well, it, why can't you just magic this away? Because as far as I'm concerned, magic doesn't really have that many rules, besides some of the arbitrary ones that don't really matter after the scene that they're involved in, so I don't see why this is supposed to be so hard for you with this particular conundrum your characters are in. As usual, I'm going to try to bring this up more when it matters, but I'm bringing it up now because it implies that first years before they go to Hogwarts have this type of chaos magic where they start doing these things that they don't realize that they're doing like bouncing off of concrete is something that Neville did because there's something wrong with Neville and you know turning their hair different colors and everything so that makes me assume that the way that you channel and control your magical powers is by using a wand and the way that they start using the wand in the first book as first years seems to just be randomly like it seems like any of the outward magic stuff that they try to do isn't really a thing anymore. For example, let's say that someone has a weird thing where if their magic is uncontrolled, they turn their hair different color. But as soon as they step into Hogwarts, the control that they have over their magic is just shown over them not being able to cast spells correctly and then they have to practice some more. Their hair thing just stops completely, as if it doesn't matter anymore. So my question is, when someone has a wand, does it automatically have control over their magic now? And does their magic not affect anything else outwardly? Is it like some weird evolutionary thing that wizards have, where the wand just has power to immediately take the magic away from any of the chaotic things that they've done before? Or is it something that they had to control over their first couple of weeks at school and JK Rowling just decided to not talk about it because she didn't give a shit? I just wonder how magic is something that exists within a wizard but also only is something that they can use if they have a wand or unless they train very specifically. Anyway, continuing on. After Harry has a nice day at the zoo, Rowling informs us that the plot is going to continue by using a terrible sentence that says, Harry felt afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. Really? Really, maybe, maybe we know that too and you don't have to include that fucking sentence. Harry sees the snake that is kept in the enclosure and Dudley and his fat dad decide that they're going to poke the glass and be rude to it. He also sympathizes with the snake because it's trapped and no one wants to understand it and he thinks about how even his life is better because with the petunia hammering on the door to wake you up, at least you got to visit the rest of the house. The snake didn't have that. I feel like the parallels between the snake and Harry as well are something that was like more shoved into a paragraph, but I guess that it has such a brief appearance because it's more of a catalyst in the story rather than something that significant. I understand that it, it's okay. At least the snake didn't say thanks amigo like it did in the movie because that was really, really bad. So he vanishes the glass away by accident and then puts Dudley in there and puts the glass back in and he doesn't know what the fuck happened. The family panics and Harry kind of just stands there, but then he gets punished by putting in the cupboard for a while, like some very extreme confinement abuse. I guess does nothing to a developing child brain because Harry doesn't really seem to give a shit. He had lived with the Dursleys for 10 years. 10 miserable years. It is here that I also want to comment on some of the behavioral issues that this book doesn't touch on. I don't think that 
children should have entirely confronting things in their stories like this because like I said, you know, children's stories, sometimes you just want to make a happy story and leave it at that. Again, because this series is trying to tackle more complex subjects, I do think that at least an introduction into some actual behavioral issues Harry would have had would have been a bit more accurate and made him a more interesting character. Having this extreme neglect and confinement in your childhood would have at least some effect on you in this way. And Harry only really seems to have a sense of mild humbleness and blankness that he kind of gets over after a while and I'm not trying to say that it romanticizes abuse or anything like that because I don't think that that's the intent, I just think that it comes across that way because it minimizes some of the things that even in a children's book you're gonna have to acknowledge. And I know for a large part it is a wish fulfillment, this entire series is wish fulfillment and JK Rowling had gone through some terrible things in her childhood, but I do think that at least some sense of reality should have been put into the family situation, to some degree. Because there's a difference between bending it for wish fulfillment, which is honestly okay, because I don't really give a shit about that, I know that the purpose is for wish fulfillment, and there's a difference between that and just completely jumping out of reality like you're shot out of a cannon, just ignoring every everything about it. Especially because we deal with abuse through the orphanage and like how Tom Riddle grew up and some of Dumbledore's background and things like that and, and even Malfoy with how little affection that he's given and how he turns out. Harry should have had some of that impact on him as well but he's more of a blank slate and that is a huge inconsistency. Harry then continues to think about how he was approached by wizards or weird people as he thinks of them who wanted to shake his hand and saying strange things to him but seemingly disappear when he tries to talk to them even more more, and the Dursleys would rush him off and freak out. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way that they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. Harry is then told that he's going to some new bullshit school and Dudley is going to some new rich bullshit school, so he got his uniform and he's whacking people with a stick. Harry sees some old clothing being dyed in the sink for his school and he knows he's going to be made fun of. They stuff people's heads down the toilet first day of Stonewall, he told Harry. Wanna come upstairs and practice? No thanks, said Harry. The poor toilet's never seen something as horrible as your head down it. This is another bit of sass that we get from Harry that hints that he does have a character and how much interesting shit we could have had from him. And I would have liked to see a bit more of how the under the stairs treatment actually affected him, such as claustrophobia to some degree, because he does get into those type of the weird things when he's at Hogwarts, so I would have liked to see at least some of that, even if at first he doesn't show it when he's introduced to a new environment that's so drastic to a degree. In the books he kind of just accepts it, like he just looks at it like, wow, this is so cool, but he just accepts it. And if he had a an actual reaction, that would have been nice. Harry has to go and get the mail, where he sees that there's a letter addressed to him, but he never gets mail, so that's really strange. Harry loves getting letters! <laughs> so he decides to hide this because he knows it will be taken away from him, so he slips it into the cupboard for later- no. No, he doesn't. He just opens it in the kitchen and then wonders why everyone is angry and takes it away from him when he should have realized that this would have happened, because he's an idiot. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written all on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, which was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. Firstly, benefits from restructuring that sentence, please. And secondly, Harry is dumb shit. His cupboard has like a slot, why doesn't he just put it in the slot? He's used to sneaking around so much too because he knows that he's going to get caught doing things that they don't want him to. Why wasn't this just a reaction, if anything? An automatic reaction? You're a stupid fucking idiot, Harry. So after they read the letter and Harry doesn't get to see what's inside, they have an ominous conversation that Harry doesn't understand and get angry. I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? They seem to want to be rid of Harry, but aren't mean enough to actually cast him out on the street because of how much attention that we get for him, and it seems like they do actually want to at least take care of him in their own way. I wonder if they would actually not want him to leave, or if they just don't want the wizarding reputation. Harry gets moved out of the stairs and in the spare bedroom. Dudley hates it but gets shut the fuck up and, and Harry mopes around wondering why he didn't hide the letter because he's an idiot. Today he'd rather be back in his cupboard with that letter than be up here without it. But it's also something where I wish that we'd at least see how he'd react to bigger spaces since he had been forced into the cupboard the whole time but that's more of like a behavioral issue thing that I talked about before. They get even more letters in crashing into the house and the owls show up in a creepy volume. Harry doesn't manage to get 
get any of the letters, though. Go to your cupboard, I mean your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go, just go. I wonder how they deal with Dudley being so physically violent so nonchalantly. Petunia seems like she couldn't handle it, so how does he get away with actually hitting them and screaming at them in this way without a single reprimand? Harry decides he's going to make an effort to sneak around and find the letters in the early morning as soon as they turn up at his house, and that means waking up really early to get them before anyone else does. Harry turned off the alarm quickly and dressed silently. Why is he even bothering to dress? When he gets there, Vernon Dursley has been sleeping in front of the door and Harry steps on his face and doesn't get the letters. Then they do some weird shit like nailing the mailbox closed and we get this line. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia had brought him. This is a funny line and comes off as very charming. I only wish that more of this was in the rest of the book. On Friday, no less than 12 letters had arrived for Harry. Do all of the people who refuse letters have this happen to them? In a way, it's kind of Orwellian because it implies he has no choice if he didn't want to go. Plus, if they were doing this because they know how he feels and the fact that he's not getting his letters, because they know that the Dursleys are hiding these messages, then wouldn't they have a more productive way of getting these to him instead of just wasting time by slamming letters into the window? They obviously have better ways to get the letters inside. One time they turn up inside eggs and then there's a bunch of more convoluted shit like that so couldn't they just teleport one through his window in the middle of the night with no one else knowing it doesn't seem like that's out of the realm of possibility because like i said there's no rules to magic in this world other than some random arbitrary ones so I don't know why they can't just do something that would possibly take less effort than this. Like if Harry had left his window open a tiny bit, then they just slipped a letter inside one day when no one would know and then he would just keep it under his bed. That problem could have been solved in like two seconds. After the owls and letters spam the house, they end up moving in an effort to hide from them. They drive around a whole lot with Vernon continuously doubling back and driving on different routes saying, shake him off, shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. Why did it get to this point, was it part of the plan to drive them out of the house with letters when they could have done something more efficient? Someone shows up at the motel they're staying at to give Harry letters. I'll take him, said Uncle Vernon, sitting up quickly and following her from, from the dining room. So the wizards clearly know exactly where these people are down to the room they're staying in, yet they don't have the power to use their big brain solutions, they're just gonna keep assaulting them and stalking them. Then they get to the shack in the middle of a lake, because they think that the wizards aren't gonna get them there, even though everything has shown that th that this is not the case. Harry counts the minutes down for his birthday and this is much more of a motif that is much more consistent than the rules thing from the first part and this is an example of one that actually works. The whole shack shivered and Harry sat bolt upright staring at the door. Someone was outside knocking to come in. The door was hit with such force it swung clean off its hinges and with a deafening crash landed flat on the floor. So if they were fine with appearing on the street to deliver Harry to the Dursley's house, why not send someone to deliver the letter if possible, because there would be less trouble and someone would get the job done because the Dursleys would be confronted by that someone and probably end up relenting in some way. It also brings another haunting implication that if you don't open your letter, a person will come track you down whether you want it or not. It raises questions about how someone would go not actually wanting to be found in the wizarding world as well. So yes, Hagrid shows up. True, I haven't introduced myself. Ruby is Hagrid. I always wondered why Hagrid seemed to know and care for Harry so much, and then in the movie he gets mixed up and calls Dudley Harry. It's weird, just, just for the movie, it's weird. Like, for, for random comedy's sake that doesn't pay off. He gets really surprised that Harry doesn't know anything about magic or what happened to his parents as well, nor did he get the letter Dumbledore gave him. Hagrid then bends Vernon's rifle, and that will never not be funny. Did you mean to tell me, he yelled at the Dursleys, that this boy, this boy, knows nothing about anything. If only you'd listen to McGonagall about this because she saw this coming a mile away. He gives Harry the letter and then writes something to Dumbledore about how he successfully found Harry. Hagrid rolled up the note, gave it to the owl which clamped it in its beak, went to the door and threw the owl out into the storm. I always found it kind of strange how they bluntly mistreat owls like this. Like, what if it dies or gets lost? Unless they're magic owls, and I don't know where the distinction is made between magic and non-magic owls. Is there another way, like giving Hagrid some of that fireplace flu powder crap? Couldn't they have taken that back 
instantly to travel. Also, how are owls not seen as much as they are in the beginning of the story? Like, in the beginning they were everywhere, but now I guess even though letters are constantly going back and forth because mail is constantly going, no one sees the owls? Shouldn't the amount of owls constantly going across the sky be something that's always a thing? I have no idea when Dumbledore told me there might be trouble getting a hold of you, how much you didn't know. Why did Dumbledore even let this happen? Is it his logic that growing up in the wizarding world as a famous person would be worse than growing up with abuse in the muggle world? So Hagrid explains that Voldemort killed Harry's parents, and I always wondered what Voldemort's whole detailed plan was with that. You know, besides being Magic Hitler. What happened to Vol- sorry, I mean, you know who. So Hagrid goes on to explain that Voldemort may or may not be dead, but people think he is dead. Uncle Vernon has a big outburst about going to the wizard school, and Hagrid tells Harry he's gonna do the magic thing. Hagrid then explains he's not allowed to do magic outside of Hogwarts, and wizards aren't really allowed to do magic outside of the wizarding world. So they know when Hagrid- when Harry, or a student, rather, does magic outside of Hogwarts. They just know it. And I guess it does the same thing for Hagrid, because they keep tabs on him and when he's supposed to use magic. How does this tracking system work? Is it different for Hagrid, and why? Because how is he getting away with using extra magic and just telling Harry, yo, don't tell anyone I'm doing this, when they should automatically know at this point? The next morning, Harry sees an owl attacking Hagrid's coat, and finds out it's there for payment because it delivered the paper. Give him five nuts, Hagrid said sleepily. How did the owl know to come all the way out here if it's not the same elf from before, besides magical means. And I would assume to deliver the paper there is a more efficient way to do so. I'm not even going to attempt to question the financial aspects of this world because the money system makes no sense. I'm gonna complain about Gringotts itself when we get there. When they go outside, Hagrid taps on his boat and says, speed things up a bit, would you mind not mentioning it at Hogwarts? So I wonder how he flew here in the first place and then speeds the boat up yet people don't detect the magic being used. Also, the something that I forgot to mention before is that Dudley got hit a tail because Hagrid like cursed him to have a tail after he got in the way and I wonder how that slipped by. And I wonder how the Dursleys got back, unless the boat returned on its own, which I don't know if it did, because otherwise they're just stranded there. So Harry and Hagrid end up in London and go to the Leaky Cauldron, which is where Diagon Alley begins. Hagrid explains the place is enchanted so that muggles cannot see the magic place or get into it. Their eyes slid from the bookshop on one side to the record shop on the other, as if they couldn't see the Leaky Cauldron at all. So I assume the shop is enchanted and they can't see it, but there's no sense of power scale for how magic works in this universe, what spells are hard to maintain and what spells aren't, what spells are almost automatic, because I assume some of these shield spells or these enchantments that are used to keep things hidden are kind of automatic yet very hard to cast, and I wonder what the distinction is. Plus, since casting spells doesn't have some sort of mana thing, does it mean that physical or mental strength is used the most? And what would that mean something about how, let's say, disabled people with less physical strength would have less physical strength to cast spells? Would that impact them? Or because they have a lot of mental strength, they could just cast them a lot easier, but it would tax them a bit in the physical department? What's up with that? So Hagrid introduces him to a lot of weirdos in the pub, and after that they get introduced to Professor Quirrell, who is going to be the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. He's very nervous and has a stutter, and Hagrid explains that he was attacked by a vampire, something. They say he's met vampires in the Black Forest, and there's a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. There's a lot of stuff introduced like vampires, but they're not explained as to how they fit into the world building, beyond something that exists in periphery, as if it only nods to the fantasy genre, yet in their mechanics and existence in itself, it's something that I think you need to explain if you introduce. Like, are they an underground society? Do they have influence in the possibly corrupt and somewhat incompetent government? Where do they fit in? especially with the werewolves as well. You know, thinking of it now, it's kind of weird to get a letter out of nowhere claiming that you need to go to a wizard school and let them take you away from your parents to go on a magical adventure. Like, it might seem good at first, but it has an ominous undertone. It's like getting an offer for a free helicopter ride from Pinochet, it seems a bit fucky. They go to the bank Gringotts first before anything else, and it's a very big place with some very big issues. 
Hagrid says, you know what, in Vault 713. This makes sense because Hagrid is inept and he can't keep a secret, I swear, but Dumbledore would have found a better way to get something secret out of a secret vault instead of just randomly saying it in front of Harry. It's almost like he wanted people to know the secrets that he's keeping, like one of those moody bastards on Facebook who says, bad day, don't ask me, and expects you to ask them. Vault 713 now, please. Can we go more slowly? Hagrid is saying this because they take this extremely violent cart to get there because it's a massive like roller coaster inside to get to the vault. The idea of the bank is so weird in general, like I wonder if there's anything like wizard ATMs. Like if you want a hundred dollars maybe and you want to get it out of your vault, would someone just go and get it for you? And if you wanted to specifically go to your vault, you'd have to do that magic car ride bullshit. And once again, I wonder how disabled people fit into this world if you can't actually go onto the carts because you physically cannot use them. Is there a gentler way of doing it or can you just teleport there? How are you supposed to access your money if you can't actually use this system? It seems like it's an incredibly volatile, violent way to do things. Also, something that I'll bring up in the second book but I want to pref like kind of bring up a little bit now is in the second one Harry gets the bones in his armory grown so I have to wonder again if someone is wheelchair bound because their legs don't work is there a way to zap all the bad bones out and regrow some good ones so did disabled people even work in this world like are they just physically not disabled and mentally I know that there's a uh, hospital for them but physically that's a bit strange. After this bank business, Harry goes to have his robes measured and meets Draco for the first time, though he doesn't know Draco's name. Have you got your own broom? The boy went on and keeps making fun of Harry of not really knowing anything. Draco is incredibly underutilized. I'm one of those people who is kind of bitter because I really like Draco and the idea of him, but he's given such little character. He's like a 2D villain, even though he could have had a really good parallel with Harry because they're both kind of in opposite situations that somehow match together. And he's also, he's given like the treatment that the movies give Neville and Ginny where they make them one note characters, except Draco is just one note in general. It doesn't matter which type of interpretation you give him. But once again, there, there's more to that for the later books. So Hagrid and Harry go to eat while they have more conversation, and Hagrid explains the bias that seemingly everyone has against Slytherin. There's not a single witch or wizard who went bad that wasn't in Slytherin. Are you telling me that there is a single house known for being like the Hitler house that maybe storing these people in dungeons, telling them that they're bad from the start, everyone being biased against them and hating them, it would have fucked with these students a little bit. There's obviously corruption at the school if one of the houses is the big bad house. And wouldn't it fuck with you if you didn't think that you were evil and then all of a sudden you were put into the evil house? All of these rich people pay for their, their evil kids to go into the evil house showing that the sorting hat is fucked up. It's a bit strange, don't you think? So Harry gets his wand, and this is where the real quirk begins. Ollivander has an extremely stupid and inefficient business practice. Firstly, measuring everywhere. When he tests the wands out, he just lets loose in the store and starts destroying everything. Like, does every single person end up doing this? Do you have to clean up your store every single time? Or possibly injure the people who are standing in line waiting their turn? Can't you just have like a room that people go into where they can destroy as much as they want in kind of like a virtual environment so that it doesn't wreck the rest of your sock? What if one of the wizard ones gets damaged and another kid can't have one because of that? Do you have copies? So afterwards, they talk about magic stuff more and Hagrid vanishes just as Harry comes back to his stop. So I guess if Harry got mugged on the way back, there goes the boy who lived. But he blinked and Hagrid was gone. This does make more sense though because he explained some things first before vanishing, when in the movie he just vanishes in the middle of them walking so Hagrid fucks off while Harry is stranded in the middle of nowhere. Even then, after he vanishes in the books, he didn't explain how to get on the train to Harry. When Harry gets home, they ignore him even more and Rowling decides to tell you this instead of showing you this. Half terrified, half furious, they acted as though any chair with Harry in it were empty. This would be a great way to contrast his behavior issues for different kinds of silence instead of the neglect type of silence and how he would react to it, but no. The subject comes up of Dudley having his tail removed and they're only now taking him to the hospital. I wonder how long that took to actually get that to happen. 
So they turn up on the platform on the time of the train departing and Vernon is very smug about the platform not existing. They just abandon Harry there to fend for himself. Have a good term, said Uncle Vernon with an even nastier smile. So am I to assume that they now think that it's fine to abandon Harry at the station? After they chased every other opportunity away that would have taken Harry away from them, they decided to just leave him at the train station. Would they have picked him up if the train didn't come? Where did they expect him to get help? What is going on? Hagrid must have forgotten to tell him something you had to do. Yeah, no shit. I'm gonna assume Hagrid didn't think of saying this, but I have to wonder, if you expect muggles to attend this school, could you at least give a note about how the train works in the letter itself? Because how do you expect them to just turn up and not know where to go? This it seems like an extreme oversight for how certain students could just not figure out how to get to the school. So I know we've gotten quite into things right now, and since this is the first review, things are going to be a little out of order. I don't quite know how I'm going to integrate it with the movie in the future parts of the series, but as of now, I'd like to just talk about the movie quickly before going into the Hogwarts stuff in the book, just for an interval. The movie cuts out all the shit from the beginning with the Dursleys and starts with Dumble Bumble arriving very conspicuously on the street. The cat also changes in the middle of the street as well, but the shadow is kind of cool on the wall. This is basically a David Lynch movie. Some of the delivery in this movie, I feel like in the way that they're trying to seem mysterious, they lack a bit of emotion, but that's more like just a personal thing, I guess. The bike is so fucking loud, it's hilarious. How did no one notice this? It makes so much noise too, it makes it look even sillier when you can imagine it this way. The cupboard that Harry sleeps in as well is very small, so it reiterates my point about abuse and behavioural problems. The whole thing is very condensed, and I think that kind of works. I just think I'm one of those people who thinks that a series would work better for a lot of things as long as it's done well, because I like a lot of detail, but you have to do what you can with these kind of things. Also, Dudley doesn't bring the friend to the zoo. The snake is very cringy in the movie. Thanks. Snake! You fuckhead. Vernon pulls Harry's hair once they get back, and he's a lot more physically abusive, I think, in this movie. Uh. One minute the glass was there and then it was done, it was like magic! That's a bit stilted, isn't it? It just shows how dumb Harry is even more, I think, with the fact that he just goes into the kitchen to open his letter when he has all of this opportunity not to do so. He is a smooth brain if there ever was one. Motherfucker just couldn't swipe one of those letters, and it really does show how many letters there are that- plus they love to spam the main theme song. I mean, I like it, but it's constantly playing in this movie. Just run out into the front lawn and like stuff one down your pants or something, get, get one of the letters. When they get to the cabin by the sea, I, again, wonder how they're gonna get out of here without a boat. They don't show them leaving in this movie, but I wonder. At least they omitted Hagrid and Harry leaving because they don't really have that problem in the movie, but I, I still think of it. Hagrid is good though, like not as good as Speedwagon, but still good. In the movie, there's this really odd part where he makes this mistake where he thinks that Dudley is Harry, and I wonder how in the hell that's possible. Like, I know it's supposed to be comedy, but it's just not... It doesn't fit Hagrid. You're a bit more along than I would have expected, particularly around the middle. He does his fireplace magic in front of the muggles, and I suppose that's fine for Hagrid, because it's Hagrid, I guess. He doesn't have to listen to the rules. They don't mention anything about Dudley's tail removal either, so... Also, I wonder when they take him to the doctor, wouldn't the doctor be confused about the tail? Wouldn't it somehow come back to the wizarding world that Hagrid had used his magic to make a child deformed? And wouldn't they punish him because of that? How did any of the fallout from that work? They never address it again. Harry also doesn't really question the magic shit or wonder if this motherfucker's on crack or if he's on crack. It kind of just goes along with it because the pacing is so fast you kind of just have to go along with it. Never insult Albus Dumbledore in front of me. Haggard being quiet when he delivers his angry line is also way more effective than shouting like he did in the novel. They also just seem to leave during the night. It kind of cuts to London and they go to the pub and everyone goes very cracked and quiet. 
It's also in the movie a lot smokier, there's a lot of mist and fog everywhere, everything looks very clammy, especially in the classrooms and the dungeon in Hogwarts when we get there. Everyone does seem a lot calmer, there's no real clamor to meet him in the pub that much because there seems to be less people. I, in, in my head when I was reading it for the first time, I did imagine a lot of scenes seemed more crowded than they do in the movie and I don't know whether or not that's just the movie changing it or if JK Rowling just writes a bit inaccurately with the placement of people in spaces. It must be a pain to wait for all of those bricks to do their thing every single time you enter. Does everyone have to do that or does it just stay open for a while? When is it closed off? I will say I think that Diagon Alley itself does look really cool, but I don't get how the bank works without wizard ATMs. What if you need normal shopping money? Hagrid is also way too conspicuous about the vault, like why not, no, why not not tell everyone? Yes, just do it in front of Harry, I'm sure he's never going to think about this again. I guess Hagrid just assumes that Harry's not going to tell anyone. When they show up at Ollivander's, Ollivander is pretty creepy. If this guy is so good at his job, why not just pick the Voldemort counterpart wand on the first try as a hunch? Like, after breaking that vase, does everything just magically repair itself? I guess if magic has no rules, that's fine. Either way, it's a terrible business model. You wonder? Should have wondered sooner. So Harry gets an owl and when they go to talk about Voldemort in this scene, they have the wobbly 90s music video filtered parents murder flashback. Okay, why didn't Voldemort step on him? It's a baby. It's like, bring one of your henchmen with you and just step on the baby or put it in the microwave, throw it out the window. It's a baby. You do not need magic. You just need a very heavy boot or maybe a gun of some kind? You fucking noseless invalid. Of course you died. You don't know how to take out a baby. That is the easiest type of human to take out besides someone who's plugged into a fucking machine. But regardless, he did what he did. Also, for some reason this book was changed to the Sorcerer's Stone in America. I guess the title was too damn hard for Americans. No, seriously, I'm not over this. You can easily kill- He also fails to a child like seven times across the years. Voldemort is one of the most inept people ever. You can easily kill an 11 year old without magic. It's called a Glock. We're not talking about the cursed child either. What the actual fuck is the cursed child? Even Bob Ross couldn't fix that mistake that you've become. Hagrid also brings up the idea of the stone or the mysterious package, let's say, way too frequently as well. It seems like he's oversharing a lot more than he did in the book. I know that they're trying to tell the audience, but it comes across as a bit uh, much. And once Hagrid vanishes, Harry immediately goes to see where the platform is, and Hagrid once again did not tell him. So we get a Weasley introduction, which is charming enough, but I must say, why does Harry buy the entire fucking cart when the shopping trolley lady goes by just because he has the money to? He could have taken one of everything, but he d do you not leave any for anyone else? Does the food just magically regenerate for everyone else? Then the ideas of chocolate frogs. Chocolate frogs are either sentient or they pretend to be sentient because they're enchanted that way, so I wonder how terrifying it is in the wizarding world that you can enchant your food to pretend it's alive so that you can have the joy of killing it while you eat it. Chocolate frogs are just very strange. The implication is that you have to like squash it or bite its head off so it dies while you eat it. Hermione is then introduced and so is Neville with his missing toad. Hermione fixes Harry's glasses and is very smug to run and then fucks off. There's also wizard cards, which are again sentient because they are sentient beings in there or beings that are supposed to look like they are sentient. This is some Black Mirror style nightmare. Well, good Black Mirror. They then get off the train and there seems to be no roll call process to see if everyone is off the train. I remember in the sixth book, Harry almost gets taken off to London again because he doesn't get off the train in time. Surely there would be some roll call at the beginning to prevent this from happening. You'd only have to do it a couple times a year. Put in the effort. The ghosts only get introduced in the Great Hall after McGonagall's speech, whereas you'll see in the book, they're introduced a lot earlier. Neville also interrupts the teacher's speech with his toad business, and Malfoy shows up in the scene as rude as fuck. Ron just ruins everything, but that's what Ron does. I wonder if there's a wizard internet nowadays, or wizard phones. I also should mention, I feel like Dumbledore isn't as whimsical in the movies, but I guess that's just one of the things that books can do, but he also is just as bullshit. He's, he's a magic is retarded. He gives them a speech after the sorting hat, but I wonder if the sorting hat is a scam. Like, 
Hear me out. Let's say you get 100 students every year. Are they magically picked so 25 go into each house? Or is a house going to have less students than others and is therefore disadvantaged? Or more students than the other house and therefore advantaged? Also, how do you know if there isn't going to be a student that doesn't fit into any of the houses? What happens to them? Unless they're somehow going to be molded into the personality the house has that they're put into, not to mention the bias that the whole school has against Slytherin, but, you know, that's never gonna change. Snape is then introduced and gives Harry an owie on his scar. When Harry is introduced to Quirrell in the beginning, they shake hands, but he apparently doesn't get hurt from Harry's touch, yet in the end, that's what happens. So I have to wonder what changed for that to happen besides Voldemort just showing himself. Like, if Voldemort is in Quirrell the entire time, is he just not strong enough to get hurt? Harry's scar also goes off at very specific times, yet doesn't seem to have a specific point besides this. It's a warning, I suppose, but it didn't go off when he shook Quirrell's hand, so does it just go off when it's convenient? I need more concrete rules for why Harry gets his scar ache and when he doesn't. I'm half and half. My dad's a muggle. Mom's a witch. Irish lad speaks in time to the music. There's feckin' ghosts everywhere. Okay, the magic stairs are bullshit. They're bullshit. So they just move around randomly. Even in the book, they mention they just move around when they feel like, so I guess the stairs are sentient too. That in itself, you don't have to explain because magic doesn't need everything explained. But I just think it's a bit unfair for people to expect the students to just show up everywhere on time when the stairs are just like that. You'd think that they'd at least try to have some sort of map system and if they can't have a map, maybe they should realize that the students need some time to get used to where they're going. These paintings that are waving at them, again, are they sentient or are they pretending to be sentient? At what point does a painting get so sentient that they might as well be alive even if they're faking it? Like, is there a Turing test for magical paintings? Do you think if a painting burns down but the person in the painting isn't currently in the painting when it's burned, they can just live on in another painting or would they die anyway? Like, is there a magic painting dimension because they all seem to visit each other out of their frames? If you have two identical paintings next to each other, does that mean those two people can just be twins? Does meeting yourself freak you out? I'm getting carried away. So Percy the Prefect leads them all up the stairs to the dormitories. Oh, and keep an eye on the staircases. They like to change. Come on. Quickly, come on! That fucking line delivery. How do the dormitories work? I understand in the books they have a bit more ambiguity. Lined up here, I don't really know how the spatial awareness works. Like, does the door have like a Howl's Moving Castle type of portal where depending on where you twist the doorknob you can go into your dormitory or are they just in other spaces because it seems like there's only room for one dormitory here. Where do the other years sleep? It's, it's not really the fault of the story, it's just the movie layout that confuses me. So they need to go to lessons, so then they rush in late because the school is insane and McGonagall somehow thinks that it's their fault. Why does she just chew them out instead of thinking, hey, maybe these first years don't know how to go around this crackhead school yet? But in Potions class, it's not any better. The dungeons look more hot and stuffy in the first movies, I've noticed, and then as they move along, they look a bit more cold. I wonder if that's just because of class time and then out of class time they look colder or if the aesthetic just changed over the years. So Snape chews out Harry for getting questions wrong and then Snape begins his need to bully a small child for seven years and then cry on demand at the end of the series, die and get a kid named after him because he had a four second redemption arc. But after that we get a spot of lunch in the Great Hall. Bring home. Turn this water into room. What's Seamus trying to do to that glass of water? Yeah, what do you think he's doing? Maybe you should listen with your fucking ears. The owl delivery is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Everyone just gets shit falling everywhere. The hall would probably be covered in actual shit considering how many owls are running around. Neville sees his remember all here and I just want to bring up, remember alls are useless. Like, what is the point of reminding you of something when you can't actually remember what you've forgotten? Like, it just beeps a bunch and then it leaves you be. A pen and paper take up less space and actually make you remember things that you need to. Remember alls are useless. Ron and Harry get the paper and start reading about the vault and the shit that went missing. So the idea is that someone broke into Vault 713 after Hagrid picked it up and if Quirrell was there watching Harry and Hagrid, which I assume he should have been, surely he would, he would have known something was up because I would have expected him to have spies following Harry around to see where they went. Once they headed into Gringotts, it's like, okay lads, they're going for this whatever's in that vault, so let's see where it is. Unless they broke in to see what was in the vault, in which case I wonder if they would have done that sooner. And how did they know which vault these guys were going to? Unless 
unless they were actually in Gringotts when Hagrid whispered this. Because if they had that information prior, you think they would have stolen it prior. So they go to flying lessons where Neville is useless. Ron is also useless. <coughs> Neville somehow fucks up immediately and I don't really know how the broom shit works because I suppose how to practice is that you have to kick off the ground and say but I suppose once you get used to it you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> This bitch saw that Neville is clearly distressed, why didn't she just catch him on like an emergency broom or something? Malfoy steals a rememberall and Harry decides that he is the law and wants to destroy Malfoy in unarmed combat. But just as he gets to it, the teacher comes by. Then the ghosts give exposition about Harry being good at Quidditch and Harry's dad being good at Quidditch. Good to know you guys are keeping up with sports ball, even in the afterlife you gotta keep busy. They also have to be reminded that the staircases move while they're walking around trying to get to class. They could have just walked around and found a better way because it still looks like you can get through the staircase multiple ways, but nevertheless they somehow end up on the third floor for plot reasons. Bullshit is not even that deep into the third floor, it's kind of near the surface. I feel like Dumbledore secretly wants kids to wander in there and get murdered. So this motherfucker explains Quidditch. I wonder what happens if you let out the balls and then they just never come back. So then they go to Charms to learn how to lift. Ron decides he wants to be a bitch and Hermione, who hears him being a bitch, decides to run away. Then we skip to Halloween. The drama queen comes out cry about the trolls, I will never not find this funny, and no one sees Ron and Harry running off when they're walking right through the stream of students so you think someone would catch him. So the troll just wanted to take a shit, but they decide to beat him up, and now they're all stinky bathroom friends after that traumatic experience. <laughs> They get a shot of his injured leg so they know that something happened to him. Harry is also being a drama queen before the Quidditch match and Snape is also a drama queen. He's limping but he's still a drama queen. They explain why they suspect Snape is behind all of these things and whisper before getting the broom just smashed into the middle of the table in front of everyone when it is clearly not supposed to be there. You could have just taken it to the Owlery and then sent Harry a note saying, hey, come here later because we have a broom for you. Good job keeping a secret McGonagall. Harry gets his broom fucked with during the Quidditch match and Hermione rushes across the stands to fuck up Snape because he, they think he's the one doing it. This movie is on speed anyway. They confront Hagrid about what they found out so far and Hagrid is dumb. They're talking about this in the middle of the school too. And then we skip to Christmas. Wizard chess. Are they sentient or are they acting like they're sentient? Are you murdering sentient life forms every time you play chess? What is this? Harry gets his invisibility cloak and he very unstealthily goes into the library. He whispers to the titles out loud of the books and you'd think that he wants to be discovered. He then takes his cloak off too. Filch's cat was also sensing him and following him around but I guess they fucked off after a while. He then finds the mirror of Erised. He only sees his parents instead of his entire family in this one. It is still kind of creepy. He screams at Ron to come and see and somehow doesn't wake everyone else up in the entire school. They also condensed all of the scenes of them going to visit the mirror into one scene until they fight and Harry comes back by his own. Hermione finds Nicholas Flamel in her book and there's no mention of the wizard card thing in this one so it's slightly less stupid. They then rush to find Hagrid at night without getting caught. The dragon is kind of gross. Malfoy somehow gets down there as well and shoves his face in the window. Neville isn't there but uh, he adds nothing anyway so it doesn't matter if he is. Dumbledore had apparently sent the dragon off in the movies so I guess he had found out about this illegal dragon trafficking but no one else really gave a shit and there's no consequences for illegal dragon trafficking. After that they get caught and they have to go into the forest of death in the middle of the night for their detention to look at gross things with Hagrid. Makes sense. Potential deaths are fine. Is there no strict punishments that don't involve death? Also, does touching unicorn blood do anything to you or do you specifically have to kill and ingest it yourself to get it? Because shouldn't touching it do something to Hagrid? So they split up because children going on their own into the murder forest is fine. There's only one centaur that saves Harry from the demon thing instead of a whole bunch of them and luckily they're not as confusing as they are in the book. They also rush into the common room and talk openly about this. Harry starts starts getting migraines the next day and Hagrid plays the theme of the movies in his hut.
So they go ask for Dumbledore and Snape bugs them and just runs them out, and it cuts to them just turning up in the common room at night ready to go. Neville tries to stand up to them but he gets yeeted and they leave him behind. They need to get to the Philosopher's Stone before Snape does I guess, and boy are they ready to do that now. The dog is already charmed by music and is sleeping. They get through all of these things and I can't help but wonder, what the giant chess pieces, the tentacle monster, the Quidditch thing, like it's all set up like it's for children, like it's trying to keep children out of here, and if children can solve these riddles, that means an adult obviously can, so how does someone not break into here sooner? How did another pair of smart children not realize all of this and break into there sooner? It just seems like an extremely inefficient way to keep a magical deadly thing safe. Hermione decides to fuck off after putting herself down because she needs to up Harry's ego, and Harry walks into where Quirrell is. Quirrell just lets Harry stand there when in the book he at least ties him up or something and tries to threaten him, but in the movie he doesn't give a fuck about why this child is standing here. There he is, the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race. You know what, I always wondered, because of that thing in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure where Araki said that if Dio had known about his son Giorno, he would have taken Giorno and raised him as his own. I always wonder if Voldemort had decided to steal Harry as an infant, infant and raise him as his own. That would have been a cool alternative. But anyway, Somehow the, the, the mirror thing works, we'll get more into that when we return to the book because I don't understand the mirror, but um, Harry has cancer hands and Quirrell is allergic so he burns. D D Harry falls over. Alright. Then Dumbledore shows up and gives some whisper exposition and Harry leaves to smile with his friends and they go fuck off. The end. You fuckhead. Harry loves getting letters! Where we left off, Harry met the Weasleys and sees Ron on the train. Ron talks about his family and asks Harry about his scar. Ron is also established to be kind of bashful and not really know when he's rambling too much, but in a charming way. Ron's ears went pink. He seemed to think that he'd said too much because he went back to staring out the window. You can also tell a lot about someone by the way that they introduce themselves. For example, Ron blabs a lot about his family because that's what he cares about. Hermione is stiff because she's awkward and doesn't really know how to make friends, and Draco says his last name first because he considers that the important part and not him as an individual. The wizard card scene happens and I have several questions. So are these sentient or do they mimic being sentient? Because you're creating copies of life that count as being alive, like a black mirror thing in some way. There are too many implications about the living portraits that confuse me too. Like are there just thousands of Dumbledores and where do they go? If he's basically immortal because of this, if he dies can he just keep running the school forever because his portrait is basically him? Hermione turns up and says she knows a lot of things about a lot of things. She also knows a lot of things about Harry and he knows basically nothing about himself. Hermione gets kind of annoying later in the books but she, she's, she's good largely. Draco shows up and one of his fat minions comes in to get some of the food splayed across the seats because there's way too much anyway, but is bitten by Scabbers the rat. How did the twins, Fred and George, get the Marauders map for part 3? Because they, they've had it since their first year I think, and they just didn't care to tell Ron that when he's in his school dorm there's just a man that he's taking to his bed every night. Shouldn't that be a bit concerning? So after this, they're taken through the school rounds to the lake and no roll call is done. If someone is still on the train, then fuck you. McGonagall takes them inside to talk to them and the ghosts fly around for a bit. The sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in front of the rest of the school. The ghosts start talking about exposition. My dear fat friar, haven't we given Peeves all the chances he deserves? He gives us a bad name, he's not even really a ghost. Good point, really. Why the fuck is there a horrible and violent poltergeist in the school with children and people just deal with him? I also don't understand the ghost lore in general, but those are ghosts. Ghosts are always gonna have, like, no consistency, so I don't really care. Harry's thoughts on seeing the Slytherin table are not too favourable. He seems biased against them already. No one seems to like them. Harry goes up and gets sorted into his house after some bullshit as well. The ghosts look at the food longingly in the Great Hall and I actually think that that's a cute piece of world building, maybe, because we'll get more to the death day party in the second book, but I do like that about them. As Harry helped himself to treacle tart, the talk turned to their families. Okay, firstly, what's the deal with the food teleportation? I know there's a bunch of house elves in the kitchen and they teleport the food up, but I also remember, I think in the seventh one, 
Ron says that his mom can just make sauce out of her wand from nothing, so is there a concept of equivalent exchange in this universe, or can you just materialize matter from nothing? Also, Neville talks about how he bounced off of concrete if you didn't think he was retarded already, which also brings back my question about how people control their magic in terms of their wand. Harry glances up at Snape again and gets another owie on his forehead. The pain was gone as quickly as it had come. Harder to shake off, the feeling that Harry had gotten from the teacher's look. A feeling like he didn't like Harry at all. What exactly makes his scar hurt? Because Harry has been near Quirrell a lot, it seems to only go off at certain times. Dumble Bumble then gives his bullshit speech. First, Diaz should note that the forest on the grounds is forbidden to all pupils. So why is something so dangerous not fenced off at least a little bit, and then you send kids there for detention and it's out of bounds? They're just fine with detention students dying because you broke the rule, but everybody else just steer clear of the forest. He then mentions the third corridor being out of bounds. This school is insane, and it's weird how they could hide the stone here and not have any other students crack the code before Hermione and the boy wonder over here do it. Surely there are other better places in the castle itself to hide this thing. Or even like have a decoy where they have it on another floor, because I think that's what they were trying to do at first, but then they just move it directly into the place where they know Voldemort's gonna go to get it. It, it doesn't really make sense. But as Harry starts school, they all look at him funny because he's famous. Harry wished they wouldn't do that because he was trying to concentrate on finding his way to classes. Some of his reactions to sudden fame could be a lot more interesting if he had an actual character with behavioural patterns. So then we get to the stairs. You'd think they'd give math to the students, seriously. Got your conk, said Peeves. For a second there I thought he said got your cock. Peeves, special victims unit. Regarding history class, which is one of the classes that everyone hates because it's really dumb, one dude just reading things for an hour, I was wondering if the portraits themselves are at least acting like their counterparts, even if they're not sentient, wouldn't you think it'd be more interesting to get figures from history to just tell what happened themselves so you'd get a lot of very interesting perspectives and then have them contrasted with the stuff in the history books? They're very underutilized, those portraits. Also, did they ever address why Quirrell smelled like garlic? Is it really because he was attacked by a vampire or does he just smell the owl letter delivery during breakfast. With all of the owls dropping stuff onto the great hall table, surely there'd be shit everywhere. I keep saying that, it's true. Like, you could just say it's letter so it doesn't really hurt anyone because it's paper, but Harry gets an entire broom crashing onto his table later. Do you not think that that would break something? I wonder how you contact wizard 911 with all of these owls flying around too. Do you think it would take a while or do you think there's a better way to do it? Harry gets his letter from Hagrid asking if he can come over for tea and he sends one back saying yes. Yeah. When he goes to potions, Snape decides that he once again wants to be a little shit. Afterwards, they go to Hagrid. A crossbow and a pair of galoshes were outside the front door. So Hagrid casually leaves weapons outside as around small children. I mean, wherever you get your kicks, dude. They also go over more information about the break-in and Gringotts, which gives the same info that we got in the movie. When Malfoy takes Neville's remember all during flying classes, it's a bit more dramatic. All of the teachers seem to pick on Neville as well, poor guy. <laughs> remember alls are so fucking useless. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once. It was one of the few that did. Of course, because one thing you know about Harry, he's perfect at Quidditch in every way. He does not have any flaws regarding Quidditch boy wonder over here. So then Neville gets injured and Madame Hooch has to take him to the hospital and leave the students alone for a while. This is why you need teaching assistants. Malfoy steals Neville's thing to make fun of him and then Harry chases him up with his broom and knocks him down. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looks stunned. Harry is just naturally a master at the broom even though he's never used anything like it before. It surely it shouldn't be that easy, but you know, whatever. His dad is also amazing at it, so I assume it's like Attack on Titan where, where one of the they join the memory stream and get all the information from there so they become naturals at it, or some nepotism thing regarding brooms, I don't know. I'm trying to make up ex explanations for this. Fred and George also mention the statue that they found that we see in the third book that leads to Honey Jukes in one of these quotes, and Rowling had enough foreshadowing to make a reference to something that would appear in book three, but doesn't have enough to fix some of the inconsistencies with her magic. So afterwards, Harry gets taken by McGonagall to get introduced to Quidditch. Foy invites him to an obvious trap disguised as a fight for the wizard's duel. Harry doesn't know what it is, but I think it sounds a bit self-explanatory. However, before he can think it over, Ron decides that they're gonna go do it, and Ron also suggests punching him in the nose, which makes me think it would work out a bit better. I have another question 
about how everyone uses magic for everything to the point where do you think that they've ever lost some of their motor skills or any other human skills because they're so addicted to magic? Like magic has every single solution and then they would have very poor practical skills because they're so used to magic making everything work for them. I wonder if that's ever an issue with anyone who has like an addictive personality. So they decide that they're going to go to the wizard's duel because they're idiots and Hermione follows them out and lectures them about how stupid they are until she realizes that the fat lady has left the portrait that they used to go into the dormitories and she can't go in anymore. Which is funny because if a student is out late at night for some sort of detention or something and they come back are they just going to be stranded out there forever because the fat lady wandered off surely there must be some sort of more proficient way to have a you know door hermione opened her mouth perhaps to tell ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogies one thing that i will say is that i've noticed a lot of sci-fi and magic stories get caught up in this idea of having this world be so wonderful that they've forgotten that rumors and legends and folklore and bullshit stories will still exist in every culture and I do like that this stuff still exists in the magic world. They still have stuff that isn't true but kids still say it anyway so one good thing I'll say about it is you should remember to still have fun with that. If you have a sci-fi story, have some urban legends that some of the characters believe or some like ghost ships and things you know just have fun with it because people will always be into this type of thing even if it's not really true in your world they keep going to where malfoy would meet up with them and malfoy is clearly not there he had tipped off filch the caretaker to catch these guys instead but they managed to sneak off just in time peeves screeches at them but they manage to escape him and but they still have to get out of there I think having peeves is fine if he was non-violent, but he fucking throws things at them at some point and he he endangers students to the point where I'm surprised no students have died from his hands. Why is he still at the school? They make it to the third floor and it's kind of convenient, easy it is to get there. Also, when they find the three-headed dog, I wonder how they got him in there. Like, was he teleported in there or did they carry him in before term started? Does he need food or sunlight or anything? Does he just exist in there? Is he just there because magic? It seems like a very insufficient thing. Also, Neville has been here for the entire chapter, but I haven't mentioned him because he doesn't have any point of being there. I feel like the only reason that he's there is because it's set up for him to come back later and try to do something plot-wise. Because there's no other reason that he's here. Once they're back in the common room, Hermione says that she noticed a trap door, so the dog must be guarding something. The next day, Harry gets his room at the dining table in the Great Hall. He finds a note attached to it and opens the note first, which tells him to hide the package until he can open it in private, because first years aren't supposed to have brooms. Which is all well and good, but the package is clearly shaped like a broom. Still better than in the movie where they just look at this broom-shaped object and they're like, wow, I wonder what that could be, and then they just open it at the table and no one notices. So there's the Quidditch scene next where Harry is being taught about the game. He is unsurprisingly good at everything. This is clearly not just wish fulfillment at all. He's also good at being a beater, he's good at not missing a single one of the golf balls they use as practice, and, and we're not supposed to question any of that. Then we get to Halloween. The troll breaks into the dungeon, and Quirrell comes in and collapses after telling everyone about this. They need to evacuate. One of my questions with this is they don't have any sirens or emergency alert systems in place, or emergency drills even. This is a school, you need to do that. Every school needs them, especially with the amount of lawsuits that you could do in this place. I know Quirrell let out the troll, but still, it should have some alarms in place that he couldn't have disabled in the first place, like, especially when it breaches the bathroom. Surely he couldn't have known exactly where the troll would go, so there should be some sort of alarm system going in place. But nevertheless, Harry and Ron go off to find Hermione in the bathroom and fuck around and knock out the troll eventually. The teachers came in because I guess they just followed the screams. Hermione lies and says that she is in the bathroom because she wanted to take the troll on for herself. For some reason, it, it actually just makes them all look worse. She could have just said that she was in the bathroom and they tried to get her out because they were concerned about her and they didn't mean to get into this mess. I don't know why she lied. Gryffindor vs Slytherin next, and I have so many questions about Slytherin, like if people think that they're constantly gonna cheat and treat them like shit, that's kind of unfair. And if they're actually horrible people, why does the school let them get away with being unfair in these matches or cheating? 
Of course, Harry is the fastest and beats the other team, but during the match, they see Snape whispering and assume that he's the one that's making Harry's broom go all fucky, and they see Snape doing some shit, but Quirrell isn't whispering, so I wonder if Voldemort is the one at the back of his head whispering the whole time, and that's why he's not moving his mouth. Once again, I love to see the a closer layout at the stands in the Quidditch pitch, because Hermione seems to just zoom up there to where Snape is. Also, once Harry gets the snitch, uh, the snitch is worth a good amount of points, and they win quite a lot compared to compared to Slytherin. So if Harry is so perfect at every single game, would it not be losing its entertainment for him because he would just win every time and he wouldn't really get anything else out of it? Hagrid let slip that Nicholas Flamel is involved. There's nothing wrong with this, I just wonder about whether or not they should have already learned about Nicholas Flamel in history class because he's so important to the idea of alchemy. Snape is limping around still, and says that the dog is dumb, out loud, so that con Harry can conveniently hear it. Then when we get closer to Christmas, the students who don't go back to their families have to stay here. I do feel sorry, said Draco Malfoy, one potions class, for all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. Draco is savage. They also bring up the only reason that he's saying this is because he's envious of Harry staying on his broom, which again angers me because Harry's just magically good at Quidditch. Draco makes a comment about Ron as Hagrid is dragging a Christmas tree in, and Ron tries to murder Draco. Snape also deducts points once he sees this and Ron complains, but Snape just walks away. Surely this favoritism and treating people unfairly would, wouldn't fly in the school and isn't good because Hagrid is a witness of this happening, as well as the fact that this could be evidence of corruption in the magical school system. Like, I know that Ron is the one who responded to the fighting, but Malfoy still instigated it, so shouldn't he get some sort of lighter punishment as well? Hermione also straight up tells Hagrid that they're researching Flamel. I don't know why. Okay, so we get to wizard chess. Are they alive? Or are they not? Either way, it's like the chocolate frog situation. You're killing something just for entertainment and it's kind of weird. Also, on Christmas they have Christmas crackers and one has mice inside. Magic mice? Highly unethical. Flitwick also gets a bonnet that laughs at his jokes. Why is everything sentient? And the chess pieces are described as alive as well, so I assume they're sentient. Harry gets his cloak invisibility cloak with his presence and decides to go out later to search for Nicholas. Wizards don't have the internet and are therefore inferior. When Harry goes out with his cloak, the fat lady is like, who's there? And she doesn't see him walk out. Is she gonna report this or no? He manages to find out where the mirror is while he's running away from Filch and sees his entire family there. I'd also like to know more about how the mirror works and if it contains the stone, why is it just hanging out here and then why do they move it to where all the traps are? Ron goes with with Harry the next time and they have a fight over who can see the mirror next because they're consumed by their desire in the mirror. Harry then goes back by himself one more time and Dumbledore finds him. Dumbledore is stupid. Is he omniscient? Does he just show up when he wants to? He knows that Harry is coming to the mirror and then waits for a while just watching him before he talks to him about it. Does he know what Harry is up to and trying to fight Voldemort by himself and he just lets him do it? What's his angle? When they find Flamel on the wizard card, You'd think that Ron would have recognized the name because of how many cards that he collects. Not to mention if Flamel is known widely in this world and Hermione can just find him in a book, surely they would have recognized his name somewhere else. Snape apparently is going to be a biased referee for Quidditch. How does that greasy cunt flap get away with such blatant favoritism? And of course, Harry does flips and shit and everyone is so amazed by him, and then he just gets the snitch in record time because he's Mr. Sportsball. After the match, which they won because Harry is perfect, he's flying around the school in the evening, and goes to follow Snape talking to Quirrell. I wonder if the school has magic sensors for students riding around at night, because they do in the Chamber of Secrets game for the PS2. Personal note, I would have loved it if there was a more adult series where there was some body horror shit where Voldemort was like eating Quirrell alive and turning into one of those John Carpenter looking monsters. Hagrid invites them to see his dragon egg. Then we get to see the dragon. How does this work? How do dragons just exist in this world without any attacks on muggles or like strict rules regarding them or something? Or are the laws so lacking that Hagrid can win one in a pub and the entire subplot can happen because he just has it and the school doesn't care? He could have hurt someone, but Hagrid just lets these idiot kids help him. And Dumbledore probably knows about it too, but doesn't give a shit about the dragon trafficking going on. And Hagrid seriously doesn't seem at all bothered about Quirrell being a weirdo or Snape being Snape. 
this is coming from Hagrid, and you don't think for one second that maybe you could get a misconception from your own eyes and that the students bringing up concerns might be something to take seriously. Like, entertain the possibility that maybe the guy who smells like garlic is a bit suspicious and not just coincidentally a fan of Italian cuisine at the most interesting times. After discussing the stone and the teachers being suspicious, Hagrid tells them about how he wins animals at the pub where some shady black market trafficking might be going on. I wonder what it's like to live a peaceful life, Ron sighed. Ron just wanted to live a quiet life. Ron's brother, Charlie, works with dragons, and he has agreed to bring some friends to help Hagrid get Norbert to a dragon reserve or whatever where the other dragons are, so because they figure out it's too dangerous to keep him in the school. I wonder why everyone is just casually conducting dragon trafficking, like even these guys who are supposed to be professional, they just do it anyway. They somehow also sneak into the school despite the fact that the school has charms up to specifically to keep people out. Then they agree to let Charlie take the dragon. This is really short-lived and very complicated, but I don't know how they pull this off. Charlie's letter to them was kept in a book instead of in one of their pockets, and then Malfoy just takes the book. Funny how Malfoy is just following them around at all the inconvenient times. He just shows up and boss music plays. They accidentally leave the cloak at the top of the tower, and it's nice going geniuses. Neville also shows up because he was wandering around after them, again and he adds nothing to the scene, again. Why is Neville... Actually, that's my question. Why is Neville? Malfoy is also caught because he was wandering around and all of them get house points deducted. The next day, Harry is suddenly hated for the points he lost for his house after he was loved from gaining the points from the match that he was out of bed at night and they hate him, but in the second one, him and Ron stab a tree with a car and everyone's like, that's metal as fuck, holy shit. They also see scared Quirrell running out of the classroom and assume Snape did something when it looks suspicious for Quirrell too because he's just like suspicious in general. Malfoy is also going to detention because he was out at night and they have to go into the murder forest with Hagrid but Filch the caretaker escorts them there in the meantime. Filch mentions that they used to hang students by the ankles in the dungeons for a few days. I assume that he's just joking to scare them but honestly with this school I have no idea. They make the kids go into the murder forest anyway, so I mean, I can believe it. They give Harry and Draco Fang dog like, hey, take this dog into the murder forest with you. They come across a unicorn and some goth bitch in a cloak who looks like he wants to attack Harry, but the horse boy shows up just in time. Centaurs are another thing, like centaurs, vampires, werewolves, dragons as well. They're all just there, but there's no system or explanation for how they function in this universe. They just live in the forest and speak very vaguely instead of saying, yo, I saw some weird shit. And then they just leave and it's inconsequential. So we've established that someone is murdering unicorns and no higher authority is sent out to deal with this. It's just Hagrid and his dog and some children. Where does the centaur property start in the forest and the school's property end in the forest? Harry mentions that they use unicorn hair and unicorn horn in class, but don't use the blood or anything, so I wonder how they get unicorn hair and horn from unicorns without killing them. What is the ethical practice going on here? Then Harry gets his cloak back at the end of the night. Did Dumbledore send this so he knew what was going to happen and he just let Harry do it anyway? Is this headmaster not being fired for enabling this. They also have anti-cheating spells for their exams, and I'd like to know a bit more about that. Is it like software? How does it know that you're copying from someone and not just having the exact same phrase that they might use at that point in time? Harry has one of his headaches, but he makes it through his exams in time. They then talk about Voldemort potentially being back, and they go out to talk about how to get past Fluffy with Hagrid, who knows more about this. They also think that they don't have any proof that Snape knows how to get past Fluffy, but I reckon that being a part of the people that make these spells as a barrier to prevent people from getting to the stone, I always assumed that they all knew how to get past each other's puzzles. Also, you have the killing curse, which is basically a shotgun, and you have actual shotguns that you could use. I never understood why wizards thought they were above using shotguns. So the story is that Hagrid got shit-faced and told the stranger how Fluffy worked and won the dragon, and then they tried breaking into Gringotts. Of course Dumbledore is not there when they need him the most, of course, so they have no choice but to go down to the creepy place instead. The teachers are blocking their way, so they need Hermione to create a distraction. Hermione tries to do it but fails after five minutes, and also reveals that she got 112 on the exam, which I have several questions about. So they want to go to the trapdoor as soon as possible, which ends up being that night. 
Neville shows up and is left frozen on the floor for god knows how many hours, because he sucks. Harry also impersonates a ghost baron with his pre-puberty voice to get past Peeves so they can keep going. Also, when we talk about the Devil's Snare chest, the Troll Snape's potions, I'd like to reiterate that these are incredibly simple, and adults would know exactly how to go through all of them, so are they keeping the children away or are they keeping the Dark Lord away? Which one? Why is there a Quidditch-themed puzzle in this place? Like, one of them is just chess. It's just chess. What would happen if you go running across the room around the board and then just, like, put some dynamite on the door? Would it blow up or is it enchantedly sealed? After Ron gets an owie and has to stay behind, Hermione humble brags and then puts herself down for the sake of giving Harry an ego boost. He also goes through Snape's puzzle after she solves it for him and ends up at the final boss. I told you, you garlic. You can't trust it. So Quirrell stands there monologuing for a while. If you had a fucking shotgun, would the magic protect the child from it? Like, would Lily's sacrifice of love protect Harry from a spring-loaded gun trap? You could have murdered him or tried to kill him as soon as he came in. You could have used the killing curse again. What if you just launch at him and stab him in the throat? Would that work? But they figure out that it's in the mirror. Well, Harry does. I wonder how they even got it in there. Are there two mirrors or did Dumbledore keep it there just to like teach Harry a lesson on coveting and then moved it back into the trap zone? And of course, Harry gets the stone out because he has pure heart. I don't see anything wrong with the pure of heart, friendship is magic type of thing, but it is it is cliche for a reason. What, like, what if he wanted to find out who Flamel was more than ever, or what Snape's plan was more than ever? Would the mirror just have himself talking to him about it? But after a quick fight, Harry discovers that he has melting cancer hands and manages to turn Quirrell to dust and then passes out. Dumbledore then wakes him up at the hospital. A fat lot of help Dumbledore was when he just turned up at the end. Like, all the fighting was done for him and then he just picked a child up and left. And I wonder why Harry's love protection thing keeps showing up in different forms like it's never the cancer hands thing again it's just like other random shit i am very confused with the convenience of these events like he just happened to show up right as harry needed help if he had touched quirrell before during the school year would this have happened would harry have his cancer hands or was it just at the end so after Harry woke up in the hospital, he asks Dumbledore why he doesn't say you know who, he just says Voldemort's name. And Dumbledore says, fear of the name increases fear of the thing itself. Tell that to Twitter. They go on with some more exposition and then Harry asks what the fuck is going on and Dumbledore says this. I know you hate to hear this, but when you're ready, you will know. Ugh. He also explains that Harry got cancer melty hands because his parents love him, so love saved the day. Can love stop a Desert Eagle 50 cal? Also, can you tell me more about the mirror's powers, please? What happens to the mirror afterwards? Ron and Hermione then talk about what happened with Dumbledore from their perspective. They had sent him a letter and he kind of met the owl in midair, whatever that means, and he just says, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he? Because he knew what was happening and he kept going despite the fact that there could have been child murder because Dumbledore is terrible. I cannot wrap my head around this. He just lets the children do the work for him, I guess. It's also funny how savage Dumbledore is when he announces that Slytherin won and then he's like, hold up, and then he gives a lot of points to Gryffindor to, to body slam Slytherin and then he's like, I think we need to revise who actually won. Like, it's, it's a bit mean. So afterwards, the school year has wrapped up and with the musical score underway, they all leave. So, like I said, I am a fan of this series, but it's just in my nature to start criticizing things probably in unnecessary degree but uh as you can tell i'm losing my voice a bit after this because this is one of the longest videos i've made in a while but i'm really enjoying making this and i hope that you at least got something out of it i am making this a whole series i might have to break up the longer books into multiple video parts each maybe maybe not i hope that you enjoyed it i also hope that one day I have more courage to share more of my art with you because I really enjoyed that as well. Either way, welcome to Wish-